Human immunodeficiency virus is a thing that usually strikes fear in most people, and it actually really has every right to. No less than roughly 40 years ago, the contraction of HIV would ultimately lead to autoimmune deficiency syndrome, or AIDS, which ravaged your meat suit and actually led to your eventual end. At first, the new mystery disease perplexed doctors, scientists, medical professionals, nurses, and really government officials and the general public as nobody knew what exactly it could be, how it spread, and how it could be stopped. As patients continued to waste away, eventually it was discovered that a small virus was attacking people's immune systems and breaking down the process of defense. When this happens, it's not the AIDS that kills people, but the opportunistic bacteria, mold, and viruses that flood in the absence of a strong immune system. With all of these microorganisms introduced into the human body, this would eventually lead to infection that could not be managed even with antibiotics or antiviral medication, which was not very plentiful back then, which would eventually end up unfortunately leading to the person getting bodied. Fast forward to the late 20 teens and research into the disease has continued and led to many advancements. Most recently, the realization by the scientific community is that if you can get the viral load levels down to undetectable, not only can you live an average lifespan of a non-infected person, but your chances of passing on this disease will become virtually non-existent. So for the first time since actually discovering this disease, sites have been lined up towards eradicating it from the human population if we are able to get the correct medication known as antiviral retrotherapy, or ART, to those afflicted. But what if a immunity could actually be found for HIV? What if you didn't just have to survive with this disease, but could actually clear it entirely from your system? Let's talk about that in this episode. So first thing we need to cover is where exactly did HIV come from? Well, there's a lot of jokes based on this, and there are like a lot of jokes based on this, unfortunately, because pretty much with ignorance breeds uh, an explanation and usually the uh, most entertaining one is the one that wins. But originally, human immunodeficiency virus actually comes from simian immunodeficiency virus. The virus was originally formed in primates such as monkeys and apes, and can actually be found specifically a lot of times in chimpanzees. This disease, however, does not affect the apes as much as it is a detriment to humans. This is not so much due to their immune system being able to handle the disease, but they lack the tissues created by the body that typically progresses HIV to AIDS, but humans will make those tissues. On top of this though, specifically chimps lack CD4 T cells, which is what HIV attacks in the human body. But the generalized thinking, which I know there's a lot of jokes like I said, but it seems to basically have leaped from humans, from primates, and this may have actually been a multiple exposure ordeal. In Africa, the consumption of primate meat is quite common in certain areas and cultures. The butcher seemingly would have been chopping up monkey meat and put it on the market, and possibly due to like nicks and cuts on his hand, or maybe even an accident he cut his hand with a knife let's say he was essentially exposed to enough infected monkey meat it's not clear if it was like a single exposure event or sustained but this particular ape's meat splashed blood actually into his wounds viruses typically cannot make leaps between species that's why you don't see any humans with say dutch elms disease but the similarities between apes and humans immune systems are quite pronounced SIV turned into HIV, and this was the original infected person. The other thinking is that someone hooked up with a monkey, but, uh, you know, that's not really been substantiated. And really, I, at least I think, and at least I hope, although I know there are anecdotal evidences out there that humans will literally get into anything. I mean, look at Homo sapiens and Neanderthal. That does happen, so... I, okay, continuing on. So, this is just the presumed reason that SIV was introduced into the human population. From here, humans will do what they do. They hooked up, shared needles, whichever they just did in their normal life, and eventually it would make its way across the country, then the continent, then the oceans. Now, the main issue is, is that the human immune system has never really tangled with anything like HIV before. The virus would go on to attack white blood cells known as CD4 T cells, as mentioned previously. And this creates a massive issue. When these cells get low in count and viral counts tend to keep climbing, the immune system can no longer activate properly to attack incoming pathogens. This allows for opportunistic organisms to take the human body as a host, which leads to an infected person's end. HIV is exceedingly dangerous and deadly as a disease. While exposure to small dose with a skin barrier in place, or even blood-to-blood -blood contact, doesn't necessarily guarantee an infection status, 
When the virus does get a foothold in the body, unless something like prophylaxis is administered probably about 72 hours within that exposure time, and even then, as soon as the exposure happens, you want to go get prophylaxis because there is no guarantee it will work after that. From what we have seen with prophylaxis, you've really only got about a 60% chance of it working to stop that disease. And if you want a video on how prophylaxis works, I'm already sure I'm going to come out with it because it's actually fairly interesting. But anyways, after about 72 hours, if you haven't gone to get help, you are pretty much stuck with the disease for the rest of your life. And currently that requires a lifetime of art therapy to keep you going. And how it does this is it keeps the viral load in your body virtually undetectable, which will stop destroying your CD4 T cells and you are able to fight incoming pathogens as a normal immune system would. So if this disease is so effective at spreading from person to person, how can a person actually be immune to the virus or even resistant? Well, let's take a trip back to what beat up humanity on the school playground back in like, let's say fifth grade and see what happened during the disease that wiped out what is assumed to be 30 to 50% of the European population, the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague was without a doubt terribly scary and terribly scary for anyone living in that time. And we think right now the coronavirus is scary. Imagine the panic, except instead of the media riling everyone up, the actual bodies dropping to the ground matched those scare tactics. I mean, it is actually quite true when I say people were walking down the streets and you had people dropping left, right, and center of you. And it was assumed to be from an angry God that nobody knew how to appease. However, it was really caused by rats carrying fleas who possessed the bacterial strain known as Yersinia pestis. This disease would drop a person within three to five days of onset of symptoms with an incubation time of about three to five days. In certain areas, the plague heavily affected and decimated town. In specifically Central Europe, the plague raged like wildfire. A group of people in this area ended up having a specific genetic mutation that allowed them to survive the outbreak. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, actually it's quite normal. Sickle cell is a response to malaria formation within the body, although it is of great detriment. Blood types are an answer to things ranging from cholera to certain flus, but mainly due to the presence or absence of antibodies within the bloodstream, but we will get to that when I cover blood types in a different episode. But regardless, these people ended up to be the last ones standing because the plague was not successful in infecting them. Or maybe it was, but the infection symptoms were not as bad, allowing them to clear the infection and continue reproducing while those without the mutation quickly fell as the genetic lineages of families just like them falling were pretty much ended in the course of say just a couple of years. However, these people with these mutations were able to survive these trying times and because of this, the mutation became much more commonplace. Today, we know that this mutation takes place specifically within the Delta 32 allele located within the human genome. The CCR5 gene, or the gene that's responsible for the CCR5 protein complex, is located on the short arm of position 21 on chromosome three. Not important, but now you know if you'd like to look into it. This little mutation had huge effects for the diseases humans would run into, or at least specifically one disease we'd run into, roughly 600 years later. With the mutation of the Delta 32 allele, the presentation of the CCR5 or chemokine receptor type 5, which also happens to be an absolutely crucial co-receptor for the HIV virus, is no longer presenting on the cell surface correctly. In normal HIV infection, the virus floats by, attaches to the cell, and at that point, you are infected with HIV. However, with this mutation, the receptor is no longer either present at the surface or not fully present. Because of this, the HIV virus is no longer able to attach to the cell. Here, the virus is not able to proliferate in the body by using the primary cells, so it is destroyed in time. This small mutation virtually makes people immune to HIV if they have the two copies of the mutation, as the CCR5 protein complex is not fully available to the HIV virus. If they possess a normal copy in a mutated copy, then the body is HIV resistant as it has a tougher time attaching to the CD4 T cells. So effective is the process that recently an HIV patient was completely cured of the disease after they underwent chemotherapy for leukemia, I believe it was, and had a bone marrow transplant from someone whose CD4 T cells were completely immune to HIV. This accident kickstarted the whole new research that possibly this virus can actually be stopped. And why did they have leukemia? Well, it's actually quite commonplace for people to start getting cancers if they have HIV, because as your immune system is weakened, you no longer have your ability to destroy those cancer cells you used to, and it leads to another whole host of problems. So I can hear you sitting there now, well, why don't we just give bone marrow transplants to everyone? Well, the first problem is it's extremely painful to the donor as they have to be awake when their bones are tapped into. 
Second, the recipient may not always be able to receive the marrow transplant as they aren't compatible with the donor. And on top of this, it is still possible to be infected with the virus via your CD8 cells as the disease progresses and the virus can kind of mutate through time and adapt within your body. But you know what though? Although CCR5 is known to play a role in helping with cancer, not really migrate as easily, and also does sort of kind of participate in the inflammatory response, although we're not quite sure how it does that, I still think this protein complex would kind of be worth sacrificing. Those with the mutation are not known to be any worse off than any of those who have not had the mutated copies. So personally, using gene therapy to alter the Delta 32 allele, I believe that would be a fantastic way to actually get this disease to succumb and get off humanity's back kind of permanently because it's just about time that we put this disease in the ground for good. All right, so I hope I shed a little bit of light on the HIV virus for y'all. I do want to note that there is, I believe, a muscular disease that does also make you resistant to HIV, but the problem is it's a muscular disease, which also kind of leads to your end, which is not really ideal. But regardless, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, please leave a like. It helps the video. Uh, sub if you are interested in science. This channel has been growing a lot lately, which has been awesome, and I'm really happy that y'all actually find this stuff as interesting as I do. All right, so stay healthy, and I'll catch you in the next one.